So today we'll be taking another look at Charizard, just like with Mewtwo. I didn't want to relegate this one to a stream redo because there's just a lot of potential here. And despite how popular Charizard is, some of you just kind of write it off as an average run. And I'm talking to you specifically, little Timmy. I'm even talking to the people that think it's going to be bad in Pokemon Yellow, but we'll get to that. Be patient. You guys already know how this goes by now. I do a series of runs and I optimize a playthrough according to the rules that you can find down in the description. And if you are a returning subscriber like Dirty Den, I do appreciate the support, but crack open a soda pop and let's just get to work I'm not gonna lie to you guys I'm a bit of a Charizard stand it's not because it's my favorite Pokemon it's not because I think it has a great design it's because it was my very first starter and just like the majority of us I was just sitting there in elementary school with a level 100 starter with four attacking moves that matches my type because that's what made sense and it's things like that that I look back on fondly and it's one of the reasons why I continue playing this game 25 years later. In terms of a solo challenge, Charizard just kind of has everything you need and more importantly it gets what it needs to meet the challenges at the right time but let's kind of start at the top. The stats, they're pretty good where they matter the most. 100 speed ensures that you're going to outspeed everything in the game, have a pretty decent crit rate, and when you got mid 80s in attack and special, it's usually just good enough. It's not a powerhouse but it's above average. The level up learn set is not the best out there, but starting with Ember is an above average starting move. We'll get into that in a second, but there's not really much else to it outside of that. Flamethrower is one of my personal favorite moves in the game, and while Slash is pretty powerful, mainly because it's going to have 100% crit rate with 100 base speed, it just it comes a little bit too late in the run to be that useful. The TM and HM learn set is where Charizard really gets the bulk of its power. Mega Punch, it's going to supplement that early game. Dig and Body Slam is going to bolster the mid game and things like Swords Dance and Earthquake are going to ensure that we maintain a strong late game. So what I'm trying to say is that Charizard, it checks a lot of boxes to do well in these solo run playthroughs. And before we go into anything else, let's kind of cover the early game here. Let's go back to Ember. It's so good because of the surplus of bug types. It just makes battles fast and it can afford me the decision here to fight all the extra bug catchers in Viridian instead of just the one mandatory one at the end. And this is where that medium slow leveling group is already going to start to kick in. It's so good. Just these two easy battles full of nothing but one shots. It gets me to level 10 and after that I do take on the Light Years Junior Trainer. Now the Sand Shrew, it has Sand Attack. It could potentially cost me some time but we do blast through it here and we're already at level 12 with very minimal time investment and now we can already just take a look at the rock solid Pokemon Trainer. Rock in general, it's the biggest wall in Gen 1. I would say most people in the know would say this is the hardest gym leader in the game. It walls like 75% of solo runs due to most of them only having normal resisted moves. And the vast majority of Pokemon, they're going to have to train to get past this. Red and Blue is a bigger hurdle just due to the Geodude knowing Defense Curl on top of both of the Geodude and the Onyx being two levels higher. But this is the second reason Ember is pretty good here. Even though Brock's Pokemon resist fire damage, their special is pretty weak. And Ember can still chew through them and our high base speed negates the Onyx potential bide damage. The decision to pick up extra battles, it essentially pays itself off here with the extra damage I'm doing. Coming here at like level 7, it just makes it take 2 or 3 times longer than it should. And here, I'm a full 2 damage rounding thresholds higher than that. And after the Geodude, I hit level 13 to hit the next damage rounding threshold on Onyx. And it makes this one a pretty simple walk in the park. Now I'm not going to sit here and pretend like Charizard is all roses and sunshine, the next reincarnation of Mewtwo. Now there are some problems, but like I mentioned earlier, the fact that you get things you need exactly when you need them is what's going to make this run ultimately really good. Now I'm going to pick up an extra battle going towards Mount Moon. Not important. Very easy. It's a bug catcher. I'm going to address a couple of things that I hear or maybe what you might be thinking. First is that, yes, this is a visual patch. It doesn't look like regular red. It has Pokemon yellow color palettes and we're using the 1997 Space World demo sprites, including the back sprites, but rest assured that it's just mechanically Pokemon Red vanilla bog standard Pokemon Red under the hood, so don't worry about that. Now, I want to talk about the elephant in the room. It's Pokemon Yellow. I bring this up from time to time. I bring it up a good bit, but suffice it to say, it comes down to the fact that Yellow is not always the hardest version or the slowest version for a Gen 1 Pokemon, despite the popular belief. And the handful of people that always tell me in every single run, every single stream that I 
do, someone always brings it up. If you want to get like a good idea of the split between red and yellow, which one's faster, roughly about 40% of my vanilla Gen 1 runs are in Pokemon Yellow. And that's mainly going to be due to the Brock split, but there are some other things that Yellow does easier, but I don't really want to get into that today. Instead, I would like to specifically talk about Charizard and Yellow. Now, the main difference here is the in-game fights, specifically Giovanni is infinitely more threatening. And for the longest time, I've sat and I thought about Yellow version Charizard for about a year. And I thought to myself, it cannot be as bad as people say it is. You have Swords Dance, you have Earthquake. It has to be extremely trivial. And I hear you barking, big dog. I hear you back there making some noise. Maybe you're saying, well, why don't you just load it up and play it for yourself? And guess what? I did. I bet you didn't see that one coming, did you? I fully played and recorded a yellow route, and we're actually going to look at it in certain areas that are supposed to be really bad for Charizard. But I do want to say up front, I want to let you guys know that red is a better run for Charizard. It's faster. And while my yellow run was still really good, it just really wasn't as refined and practiced as you're going to see here today in the, most of the footage. But I mainly just wanted to do it to see if it was actually hard. Now, there's no real point of reference for a Charizard yellow run. There's one. Scott did a video like in, at the end of 2021 where it started as like a Charmander, for example, and it went to a Charizard. So it's a lot different. It's very dated. I know that. Take it with a grain of salt. I just really want y'all to know that it's really dated. But there are two things that I thought about when I watched it. Number one, there's no way that Charizard is the worst starter. And there's definitely no way he's that far behind the other starters. And number two, even though it's dated and it started out as a Charmander, Scott's final time was like an hour and 14 minutes, which is absurdly slow. I know it's old, it's office modern times, but that would be like an E tier for him, which if you want to equate that to my rankings, it would be like Onyx tier, which is like less than a 40 out of 100. But it's hard to compare that run, but it's literally the only thing out there. It's really old and it's really not that optimized of a run. It's not really that good. It's just really old. But what I really wanted to say, what I really wanted to drive home for the point here is that the runs are very similar and they really don't differ until like a maybe two or three battles towards the end of the game but we will look at both versions that's what i'm trying to say i probably could have said that in less words but it really wouldn't be my channel if i didn't go on some tangents and start to incoherently ramble but let's keep it moving now there's still some extra training to do in Mount Moon. We want to take full advantage of that great medium slow experience group. So I do fight the Super Nerd, I fight the Double Grass Last, both pretty staple fights to do in these runs. Mega Punch, it's also pretty big for the run like I mentioned earlier. It allows you to hit really hard and do significant damage to things that resist fire. So it's a pretty key component to the run success. Now after that I do actually fight the Hiker and it's the same exact principle here that it was for Brock. Ember is resisted but they have weak special so it makes it a pretty quick battle it's worth a lot of experience and ultimately i wrap this part of the game i hit level 20 going into the coughing on the final super nerd and that's going to set us up for success when we finally hit cerulean that means rival number two is up immediately and mega punch is the play here and you kind of just like always you hope you don't see a sand attack and we do immediately so that's just fantastic i keep punching i miss a little bit and eventually i do connect i take out the sand attacking bird and from there i just swap over to scratch because it has a lot higher accuracy and it allows me to get through the fight albeit slightly slow due to the accuracy debuff and already in this video we are essentially at the end of extra battles that's kind of crazy and that should tell you a lot about the run and the state coming up. This is where Charizard is by far at its weakest point in the game. And the goal now is gonna be to navigate the game in like a really efficient path to hopefully see this winged little lizard fly as high as it can go on the tier list. But now we got Nugget Bridge coming up and you guys know what I always preach about this part of the game. It has a lot of mandatory battles. In fact, you could say that it has the most grouped up little clustered mandatory battles in the entire game. So just don't do this part with a subpar move like Scratch, go all out, make it as fast as you can. I'm not going to preach. Let's skip to the end. Next up, I am picking up Dig from the Cerulean Grunt, and this is the tool that Charizard needs in this moment to easily get past Misty. Now also, the extra training earlier in the game, it will let me hit level 25 right when I get done with the Golding Junior Trainer in front of Misty, and with that, let's kind of take a look at it. There's no intro needed today, and for good reason. You'll see why. Charizard is really fast, and it has enough bulk for this fight to 
tank a move or two if it absolutely has to, but first, let's just kind of one-tap the star you, get it out of there, let's get to the good stuff. Starmie is normally a nightmare for Pokemon that's weak to it, but for Charizard, it really flexes its muscles here. I outspeed, I hit dig for over half, and I can tank essentially anything it can throw at me. Even if it crit, I would still probably live outside of the bubble beam, and that's just gonna set me up for a lethal dig, and we're gonna end this fight really quick. And I just, I can't count how many runs I've done over the years that are just so so much worse than they could be just due to a weakness to Misty. Even neutral runs that have a low special just have to skip her and with a great Brock split and ultimately a pretty nice Misty split, we're kind of seeing pretty early that Charizard, he's not a pushover. And the fact that this is the roughest stretch of the game, we have no resets and we're sitting at sub 40 minutes of in game time, it's a great start to build off of. Now let's keep the momentum going. And that's going to take us all the way down to the SSN and there's a couple of goodies I want to pick up here. First up is rest. I normally don't bother with rest and it's not going to come up for a long time, but just keep note of that. The second thing here is going to be body slam. We all know body slam. It's going to come up immediately. It's going to be useful for the whole run and we can just go straight into that third rival fight. From here, we'll talk about something that's kind of like a slight disadvantage that's going to hold Charizard back as we transition into that mid game. And it's the fact that it's just not an offensive powerhouse with base stats alone. It has really solid attack. It gets some good moves moves, but it can't just mow down everything and just one hit every Pokemon that comes out in front of it. Now you're going to see it here, Body Slam. I'm going to fail to knock out the Pidgeotto. I'm going to take a Sand Attack. And it's just a little bit slow compared to maybe if Charizard had like a 100 base attack, maybe a little bit higher or something like that. It just, it doesn't matter a ton. But if the, you know, the enemy survives here, it gets a turn there. You have to take a second turn a few extra times. It just starts to add up in the long run. But let's move forward to a fight that doesn't have this problem at all. Now Lieutenant Surge gets verbally done on pretty much every week by a lot of people but let me just say that his good AI and Pokemon red and blue do make it dangerous if you're like a water or flying type but I can't say it enough how good it feels to have ground coverage as a flying type. The problem in general for flying outside of having like 47 weaknesses is that they usually just lack coverage and the coverage here just shines very bright. There's not much to say about the actual battle but dig it's just very helpful on a flying type that's that's the whole point you get it. Now we can zoom it all the way to Celadon, and since Ember is just a little bit weak, I'm not gonna go to Erica immediately. Now this limits our options. We have to go to the Rocket Hideout, and things are gonna be standard. We get high money items. There's no need to look at Giovanni since we have Dig, but after that, it is time for an early shop buy. There's nothing extra here today. I don't need the Pokedom. I'm not gonna get Mimic. I'm not desperately trying to go to the top floor to count out every single penny to squeak out a vitamin. It's all speed. It's all efficiency here. But with the hideout items, I can afford five proteins to bolster our attack, and we can just be on our way. Pokemon Tower is up next and I still don't love the Erica matchup and some extra levels is going to help that out. Outside of the easy rival of number four fight, just notice that three members of his team don't go down to a single body slam. Like I just said, it's very minor, but I would like to reiterate that neutral matchups for Charizard in the mid game just require a little extra time. Now the gas leaves, the rest of the tower, it's not worth looking into. We have dig, so we can skip over and pick back up when I'm heading towards Erica. Now the biggest flaw in my original run was the extra training I did in the mid and the late game, specifically Erica's trainers. Now, I'm not sure if any of you remember that run. Uh, I love the video. I actually went back and watched it, but I got para wrapped here by the very first trainer on the Weeping Bell. It was awful. Now the biggest change in today's run was, you know, the streamlining and the precise planning you've come to expect from my runs. And I'm just, at this day and age, I'm just better at knowing what parts of the game are unnecessary time sinks. Now as for Erica herself, there's not really much to say about it. I'm pretty sure good AI is going to force her to use things like wrap or poison powder, but they do have the potential just to waste time and I just wanted better ranges. Now you're, you're going to see me crit a couple of times here and it really helps to speed this up, but I'm a fire and flying type. I double resist grass. It's really what you would expect overall. Now from there, it's time for a very quick Safari Zone visit. Things are really standard here, but at 100 base speed, there's really no need to pick up the Carbos. Uh, it would just waste extra time picking it up, going into the menu. So save a little time, but this part's over. Now it's time to really raise our power level, go even further beyond. 
This takes us to Sylph, and the clear goal, everybody knows, it's Swords Dance. It's going to let us take on all challenges in the game without acquiring any additional training. But first, we do need to visit that 10th floor. There's a rare candy, and more importantly, Charizard just gets earthquake coverage. It's so good. And now, while I'm sitting here walking to Swords Dance, where we're ultimately going to massively upgrade our move pool, let's talk about something that kind of was a challenge for the run. Originally, I was using early candies to make things a little faster, a little smoother. Either, but what turns out to be more important for this run is balancing out how long you can keep dig and eventually kind of coinciding that to hit level 46 for flamethrower that way you can use both to their full potential without sacrificing anything in the run now in the final route here i went without candies and the goal here is to be as fast as possible so we're not going to dig out we're not going to do a half silf today it's time for five Pidgeot is first, and we're gonna need to set up here. Pidgeot can survive multiple hits without the boost, and what you hope here, like always, is no sand attack, but just like all the times earlier, an earlier sand attack here has me shaking my fist at the air, asking God why to the clouds. Now, I, I get to plus four, that gives us the damage for the rest of the fight, and at this point, it's pretty much just all up to those accuracy debuffs, if it's gonna cost us or not, and spoiler alert, it doesn't. I set up one extra time just to kinda hopefully maybe offset some of the misses, and even though I do miss on the Growlithe, it's a Growlithe, it doesn't matter, and I actually just kinda hit all my moves after that, and even though Swords Dance doesn't need me to sing its praises, we know how good it is, it's just, guys, I'm telling you, you can make like a C tier run up to an A tier run. It's just, it's really good. Now it's time for a mini boss rush, and let's start with Sabrina since she's in the same town. It's the most time efficient. Now you take out the Kadabra first. It can hit pretty hard. You don't really want to waste time setting up. And after that, you set up once, and you can just go on a tear through her frail team. Even though the Alakazam survives a hit, it just, it doesn't matter. Rolling straight into Kogo, we do have EQ, and even with Dig and no Sword Stance, we could have just came here first. But it's worth noting that taking out Sylph immediately, powering up, then taking out the rival and Sabrina, it's just a little bit faster, but you've seen the footage here. This one's a route. This is par for the course when you have a ground move for red and blue Koga. Now let's slow it down a little bit. Let's dip our toes in the water. We can take a very brisk swim down to Cinnabar. Even when you're on the most breakneck pace speed runs, you just have to stop for a second and enjoy the scenery every once in a while. And of course, this has the added benefit of letting us just ponder if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not. And as for Blaine, he's going to function pretty much as a slightly tankier version of Koga. This means a very simple plus two with one sword stance will put all of his Pokemon into EQ ranges. And let's just, let's wrap it up quickly. And that's pretty much the end of this little boss rush. There was no need to go into those trainers too much. Now, my friends, it's time to talk about yellow. And I just noticed that I played both of these runs on the same overlay. So this is a note for future editing map. Put like a Pokemon yellow box over the bag number or something like that. The main thing here I want you guys to notice is that these two runs are only about a minute and 10 seconds apart which would only be like 20 seconds if I used real life time, but this is the part we need to see because apparently Giovanni and Pokemon Yellow is just a huge threat to every Pokemon, specifically Charizard, but let's dive into it. We're gonna look at the Yellow version run first and we're gonna talk our way through it. On the Doug Trio, you are outsped, and this is mainly due to me just basically copying my red route verbatim. You could just use pretty much one extra Carbos and solve this problem, but the main thing here is that you don't want to take a sand attack. It's really annoying, but for once in its life, the flying typing actually completely walls this Pokemon. It kind of just flops around, and you could just straight up use a couple of EQs and take it out, but you don't want to set up here because of the accuracy debuff chance. It's just too much. Next on the Persian is where you kind of want to take your chance a little bit. You can just kind of take whatever damage it wants to dish out, or in this case, just live with the double teams it's going to use. I do set up to plus six, and essentially, this might be a sh big shocker for some people, but that's essentially the battle already over with. There is one potential lose condition, and that's if you crit, and that's exactly what I'm going to do on the Nidal Queen here, but it does miss the follow-up Thunder, and Thunder just, Thunder's bad. It has bad accuracy. It has a higher chance to miss than I do to crit, and you know, it's just unlikely we would see both of those in this situation, but it's business as usual after that. 
I do hit level 46, and since there's no more dig time skips that we can use outside of battle left in the game, we can actually replace it with flamethrower. But this battle is just kind of like a series of one shots, and like I suspected, I did this fight on the first try. I didn't level up any, I didn't think about it any extra, and it's just kind of crazy to me that anyone would actually think this fight is difficult when you have Swords Dance and Earthquake. Now I'm going to flip back to the normal footage and I'm going to give some additional thoughts because we don't really need to go into the red and blue Giovanni fight. And I, I promise I'm not trying to be braggadocious or arrogant here. The solution just kind of seems so obvious to me. And you can just do this without any additional grinding. Now for this run, I've already said this before, there really isn't anything modern or optimized to directly compare it to. Let's go back Back to that Scott video I talked about and we remember it being kind of rough here just remember a few facts right let's just go over this real quick it's from 2021 it's a very outdated run it's not optimized and his Charizard's like 14 levels higher and it doesn't have Swords Dance or Earthquake for some reason now there's a reason that if you look at his tier list nowadays if you watch like a Pokemon Yellow video and go to the end there's a reason that these starters aren't on the tier list anymore maybe one day he'll redo it I'm sure he'll correct all his mistakes but at the end of the day what I'm trying to say is that this fight's pretty easy the solution is two plus two don't overthink it guys just use sword stance use earthquake it's over with now at this point both runs sit at a very good time with zero resets and there's no reason for us to go back to yellow version for now so let's just get rival number six out of the way and with a learn set like this you sort of know how it's going to play out by now the key difference here is that the Pidgeot no longer has sand attack I bring that up a lot but it's very important and this just gives us a strategy where I can just kind of soak whatever damage it wants to do this it's not a threat anymore we can get up to that plus six and the real reason you want to set up three swords dance here is the threat of a blastoise hydro pump now with plus six your only lose condition you would need to crit on the blastoise fail to knock it out have it select hydro pump it has multiple choices it can pick and it needs to hit with that 80 percent accuracy now it's not impossible to do that but what i'm saying is that i'll just take my chances and let's start thinking about the lead When you're routing this run, you got one big decision and this is what it usually comes down to for any Pokemon weak to water types. Do you massively bloat your time in a futile effort to make Gyarados 100% consistent? Or do you just kind of realize that 100% consistency, it actually wastes a lot of time and it's not worth it in almost all situations. Now there are two runs that led me to this decision to a YOLO Gyarados is what I like to call it. And these two runs are runs that I've streamed in the past. Now Charmander, first stage of Charizard and Sandshrew, they have times and ratings that are probably Probably a lot higher than you would expect and it's due to the fact that you know waiting for Gyarados to miss a hydro pump 20% chance it's much 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 I gotta really emphasize that much faster than grinding 10 or 15 levels and it's even more so if you're using like a real life time metric it's a little bit slower for me because I'm I play on slower speed I use in-game time but do you guys know how long it takes to get like 15 levels it, it's a lot and we're gonna go on a slight tangent kind of just breaking off of that uh, I think 100% consistency and minimum battles they're about the same to me in terms of the fact that they've almost feel like clickbait terms at this point more so minimum battles they just don't really mean much like they've lost all meaning like they don't translate to a greater challenge they don't translate to a faster run and it begs the question to me personally like what's the point what's the point of doing it maybe so you can put it in the thumbnail I really don't know but I do get that people have fun in their own way everybody has their own way to have challenges everybody has their own rules I get that so before you go down on the keyboard and you're clapping around to leave a mean message I get that and everybody can play at their own rules I'm just this is my video I'm just saying it doesn't make much sense to me because I want to see how fast the Pokemon can beat the game minimum battles 100% consistency they're not that guy they're not that guy bud now the only thing I can say definitively about this run as I get off this tangent is that a Yolo Gyarados strat after you've routed the game to exactly hit level 48 from this point it's the fastest Charizard route out there and if you doubt that sit down son you're talking to the champ put some respect on my name Stop talking and just listen. Learn a little bit. Now, as far as Victory Road goes, I'm actually going to skip the rare candy in here. And I guess I should bring up that I did. You're probably watching it right now. I used all 10 of the collected rare candies. I hit level 58. And through various runs, routes, optimization, it's just, it's exactly what you need is what I'm trying to say. The extra level from that candy, it just does nothing for you. Now, keep in mind that the yellow route, it went the same exact way. I skipped the candy. I used all my other candies. So let's not stall anymore. I'm going off script here. I'm kind of going off the rails but now let's dive into the elite four let's uh, steer the ship right and let's see how this little charred lizard actually does i 
I want you guys to remember one thing about Generation 1, and it's the fact that fire does not resist ice in this game. That means we are actually weak to Lorelei, but she does have a cheat code if you have a setup move. Now, seriously guys, just smack it with any damage. Put any damage on the Dugong, tank the move, and there's a very, very high chance in red and blue that she'll go for rest on turn two. This allows you to completely free set up, and even though we are at the top disadvantage and this fight could be difficult, it's already over. We've already set up the plus six attack. Now, even on something tanky like Cloyster, you have way more than enough damage, and this is why runs like Farfetch'd or Sandshrew could just ignore Lorelei, ignore that ice weakness just due to her turn two AI if you set it up right. But that's how it's done. This battle's clean, and we're actually gonna swap back over to yellow version because there's something very important about this fight. Now, while red and blue Dugong just has a chance at using rest on turn two, it's pretty much all but guaranteed in yellow version. It actually makes fights in these types of situations easier easier overall, and even though I do crit on the Cloister, it's still a one-shot victory. I just want to say that if you're ever having Lorelei troubles and you have a setup move, just abuse that turn two Dugong AI and you'll be just fine. I can't stress that enough. I see a lot of people struggle on it. Just do it like this. That's it. We're done. Bruno is next, and this is pretty much the one spot of the run where Flamethrower is really nice. You can avoid using Elixirs, you can avoid healing, and you can just toss out some flames all day long, and you can get past this one pretty easy. It's pretty free, but I would like to specifically call out the second Onyx. It survives a range, and it has the gall to hit a rock throw here but if you ever want to know if you ever want a good idea in your mind why onyx is ranked where it's at look at this double super effective rock throw damage i was already missing like a third of my health and it really doesn't do that much i survive comfortably and then just from there i bathe them a champ in fire and we're on to the third member it's no surprise that Charizard's toolkit completely handles Agatha as well. Outside of the Golbat, there's no setup required, but one setup does put that Golbat into some better ranges. I get confused, and when I hurt myself once with a Swords Dance, I decide just to keep setting up. Like, you might as well, you know what I mean? You might as well dig the hole deeper. I actually take a lot of damage, and I continue to hurt myself here. It doesn't really look great. I go down to just 29 HP, but Charizard he snaps out of the confusion just in time, and it's time for the Sweet. This one actually drug on a little bit and I lost a little bit of time, but it's kind of like a pick your own poison situation. You can knock out the Gengar immediately with no setup, but after that you have to deal with the Golbat. It can survive. You're not going to one hit it. It can be just as annoying with Haze or Confuse Ray, but it works out here, albeit a lot closer than I would like it to be. Now it's time for Lance and we're going to look at both versions starting with Red, but I need you guys to understand one thing. My time, it was just so good here and in this moment, in my excitement, I forgot one key to decision that makes this fight a lot more risky than it needs to be. I forgot to use rest. I got it so long ago. My strategy involved being level 60 with rest and it was a pretty solid strat, but let's hop in and see if Charizard has any more surprises because I made a blunder here. Let's see if it cost it. It probably should. Now, like I said earlier, this is a YOLO Gyarados and what makes it more consistent on Charizard is that it takes two hydro pumps to knock us out and that gives us double the chances to see a miss. All we need is one. Here I set up. Gyarados misses on turn one. At this point, I can get past the Gyarados with two body slams, but you do get low enough to where you can still easily lose and rest solve that problem. But miraculously, Gyarados misses a second Hydro Pump, and I knew right here this had to be the run. This means that I'm moving on at full health without much of a care in the entire world. Let's talk about the strat a little bit. So normally you get knocked down to about 65 to 75 health and with Dragon Rage and the fact that you need to set up more, it makes things really risky. If you can get set up, soak the damage, heal up with rest, it makes this fight surprisingly consistent. But sometimes when you do YOLO Gyarados, this is the result you get. And you're gonna see the very familiar side of an attack boosted Charizard just putting in work. He's like a lizard on a mission. He's got the fire in his eyes. Not much else to say about the red version. We got pretty lucky. No resets. We're moving on. Now we're going to flip back over to that yellow version. And in this fight, way above Giovanni, like on a different planet than Giovanni, this fight was a hassle. I remembered rest, but the drawback to the yellow strat is that sometimes that 20% chance to miss just never pans out. The computer decides that its hydro pump has a 100% chance to hit now. I have two resets here, and Gyarados isn't even the reason that this fight's a pain, believe it or not. Now you can just have resets from hydro pumps and whatnot 
whatnot, but it really doesn't matter. Let's skip ahead to the third attempt. I finally get that Hydro Pump miss, and we make it past the Gyarados, and the first Dragonite is gonna be pretty much to me, I think this is the real nightmare, because it has Thunder Wave. That's essentially gonna be a death sentence that you can't rest off the Paralysis Speed Drop in Gen 1, and it has Thunderbolt to do super effective damage. You essentially gotta hope that you're asleep when it goes for that Thunder Wave to avoid it, and then you kind of like stall the fight a little bit, set up here and there, and at the end of the day, you gotta be healthy enough to take the rest of the fight. Now, although I don't get any additional resets here, this fight, it goes back and forth, and eventually I decide to pull the trigger, but you're gonna run into the same kind of problem with Ice Beam on the second Dragonair, so you gotta keep using rest, keep setting up, and you just gotta take note of your HP and just kind of pick your moment to strike, and after all that, I finally pick my moment. Aerodactyl resists Body Slam, and it has the audacity to crit me with Fly. It takes me down to just four HP for the second time in this fight, but I can finish it off. And even though we're really low, Charizard has enough damage to finish off the fight, but you can see the difficulties. We only had two resets here, but you could easily fail this fight a lot more, especially if you aren't prepared, but it's over with. And this is the last big change from the red run to the yellow run. So we're gonna go back to the red run and we're gonna finish it off with the final battle. Pidgeot is first, and although this goes smooth, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. When I see it mirror move Swords Dance multiple times, it kinda had me sweating a little bit. But eventually, I do hit that pivotal plus six to attack, and it's time to do what Charizard has been doing all run, and that's blast people into the ground. Alakazam is the first victim, but it's frail. It was never really a concern. I'm in danger! And after that, its next two Pokemon are actually weak to Earthquake, both Rhydon and the very thick puppy Arcanine. So we got those boosts, we can make it even more potent. And after that, it's time for everyone's favorite coconut tree. Even though we kind of lucked out and we got to keep Flamethrower by forgetting rest, Body Slam is gonna be the play because it uses our attack stat. We take it out, one hit, and just like that, we're at the end of the fight. I let a super powered Earthquake loose, but once again, the crit gods strike again. It means I don't knock it out. This could be the end of Charizard's run of luck and the rival, it goes for the kill shot with the Hydro Pump, but Charizard says not today, friend. It avoids the attack, and that allows me to finish off the run on the next turn, and that's it. Charizard finishes the run with a time of two hours, 16 minutes, and 50 seconds with zero resets. Now the zero resets, it was a little lucky, but to date with vanilla runs, it's only the third other Pokemon to achieve this feat. Now before I talk about the rank, let's kind of peek in at the yellow final time and talk about it. This Charizard, no surprise here, it also one shots the champion fight. And by the time we knock out Flareon, we have another impressive time of two hours, 21 minutes and 58 seconds with just two resets. Now let's kind of talk about the tier cards. And let me just say, if you're looking at the tier cards and you want actual numbers and formulas, I do have an unlisted video, check that out. But we're not gonna talk about that in this video. Now, if yellow was the only run I did, it would still have a score of 94.5 out of 100. That would be great, fantastic, really good. It would put it at sixth place overall, actually. But the red run, it's even better. It's time, combined with those zero resets, it puts it at a whopping 96.6 six out of a hundred and that puts it at fourth place overall behind titans like Mewtwo, Alakazam, Articuno, which is some really good company to keep. Now, I might redo Gengar, and it's likely gonna move up and replace Charizard, but even then, I'm extremely happy with the run. Was there some luck involved? Sure, when is there not luck involved in a Pokemon solo run? Lance in a perfect vacuum would probably cost a few resets on average, but like I just said, do any run. You saw in the Mewtwo run, even, even on that run, I lost to a Zubat one time, so there's always some luck. Now, you guys already know, you have to take some risk if you wanna get the best time, if you wanna keep pushing the envelope, and if you're like me, mediocrity is just not something I like to settle for in life. Be better. Stop doing the same routine, guys. If you just keep doing the same, same strat, same everything, you're never gonna improve. Now, more than likely, I'm hoping that I can get maybe like a handful more of Gen 1 runs done before I start to actually maybe do a video on the tier list. I might have to do like a stream or an unlisted video because I know the video is gonna bomb on views. I really don't care about that, but I would like to break it down, but it's October soon. Hopefully I have a few good ones coming up. I don't know. I'm in school Cool right now I've been talking about it a little bit to you guys it's rough but so far I haven't had to slow down yet but I think we will eventually there's no doubt in my mind we're gonna have to miss a week eventually and that's okay I'm not
not upset about it. But I think that's going to be about it for me. If you made it this far, you're a real one. And at this time, comment true real one because I think some people just like to say it these days without actually hearing it. So call them out if you see them. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. It means a ton to me. Love the support. Love you guys. And I think that's about all I have for you. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Bye.